Stanford University. Today we have the good fortune of having Chris Duvos of Venture Investment Associates come speak to the class. This is the first time in the three years that we've had the class that we've had an LP come to the class, so this should be super interesting. The, Chris has been working at Venture Investment Associates since late 2011. Before that, he was working at TIFF, and before that, he worked for the Princeton Endowment. And uh, on his blog and on the VIA's website, it says uh, he's working, he worked at Princeton despite having two degrees from Yale, which is the <laughs> rival university. So without further ado, Thank you for coming, Chris. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, when I was at Princeton, we used to uh, we used to have you know managers come through and and you know all these you know GPs would come you know kind of down the East Coast or up the East Coast. They'd start in Boston, they'd go through New Haven. You know, and a lot of the Harvard team they had Harvard degrees. Everybody at Yale has Yale degrees. They come in and they say, Hey, did did you guys go to Princeton? And, uh, and actually, interestingly, in the investments office, we didn't have uh, any senior staffers with Princeton degrees, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, but I always said, uh, I always said, well, no, I don't have a Princeton degree, but I went to Yale not once but twice. As they said in Roman times, ubi panis, ibi patria, there, where there's bread, there is my country. And Princeton's got a lot of bread. <laughs> and I'll get a little laugh line and you know, kind of break the ice. And, and it was good fun. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but we, we used to have a good time. The other thing uh, you may note, and I don't know how many of you guys did the reading, uh, uh, if, if you guys sent out the, the assigned blog post, my blog is entitled Super LP. And, uh, and I don't call myself the Super LP. In fact, I actually don't do it. Everybody else does. Um, I don't call myself Super LP because I have any aggrandized vision of myself. But rather, it's because I always wear red t-shirts, which was this bizarre habit I ran into um, I was on a, on a trip, like a, you know, kind of a two week long trip overseas looking at funds and I ran out of white t-shirts and I went to a store and the only t-shirts they had were red t-shirts and I go to this meeting that night wearing a red t-shirt and somebody comes up to me and says, are those your super LP underoos? <laughs> All right. And I said, yes, somewhere there's a GP in trouble and I, you know, rip open the super LP and, and I, you know, kind of a, a, a nickname was born. Um, <laughs> So anyhow, it's, it's really interesting to talk to you guys, um, and I'll be curious to, you know, you guys have, have looked now, I guess I'm the last piece in, uh, in the puzzle or, or kind of the, the newest vantage point on this interest, really interesting cube that you guys look at. And I always say, you know, I'm the money behind the money. And in fact, it's actually kind of an interesting time because I just, um, I just had my, my own investors in town the last couple of days uh, to show them kind of the voodoo that we do. And uh, it's interesting because my investors invest in me. I'm a fund of funds manager. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I invest in general partners, and general partners invest in portfolio companies. So if you think about it, the, the lineage from my investors to the actual assets is pretty attenuated. Um, and needless to say, at every stop, there are people taking uh, you know, some, some golden breadcrumbs. Um, <laughs> some more golden than others, uh, indeed. Um, but, uh, but that's pretty common. I mean, if you think about what a university endowment is or a foundation, they are all fund of funds. They just happen to have a single client. Um, and so I just happen to have many clients. Uh, but it's interesting because I run a, a little seed fund in addition to our main fund. And so I was kind of taking these guys out and, and kind of the theme this year was, um, was kind of the new and interesting stuff that's going on in, uh, in venture capital. And it was so much fun to see these folks who are at large institutions themselves, guys like you know, DuPont Trust and Case Western University and, and, and others, NYU and others, um, you know, kind of you know, playing with toys, literally. I mean, we went over to 3D Robotics in the East Bay where Chris Anderson's got his drone company. And we were flying drones. And, and then another toy, an intellectual toy, we went over to AngelList and kind of spent some time talking about the Syndicates platform. And it was just a lot of fun to see that kind of short-circuiting of the process from you know from these people who are so far attenuated to you know to the actual assets and uh, and that's that's something that I really really enjoy. Um, what I enjoy about my job is that I actually get a really interesting kind of overview of the landscape. Whereas the you know the kind of GPs that you talk you you guys have talked to and heard from, um, you know they have a very kind of small window on the world. I actually cover a pretty wide waterfront, and uh, and my days at Princeton and and at TIFF also kind of covered. You know, all assets so had a, a, a much wider aperture, and so it actually makes uh, the uh, the challenge of investing um, much more real. Um, you know, there are a lot of people 
who, who think that there's a grand spigot of money somewhere out there in the world that kind of funnels uh, you know, all kinds of liquidity to this zip code, and then we kind of parcel it out. But really, that funnel of money is, is uh, that spigot of money is, is affected by a whole bunch of things, some of which I'm going to talk about to kind of sensitize you guys to the kind of ecosystem or the food chain of, uh, of investing. So without further ado, let me take a, a swig from my big gulp, my double gulp. And and uh, and send us out on the road. So it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I was telling Tim that my mom is in town from Brooklyn, and uh, and my mom, you know, she's an, an immigrant. And she you know worked all her life in uh, in a in the hotel industry, and and she's she's a hoot. And she's like, tell me again what it is that you do. And I try to explain it, and she says, so you are a stockbroker then? I'm like, no, I'm not a stockbroker. Um, I do some really bizarre stuff. Um, and uh, I actually, and then I explained to her, I said, Mom, I go out to people and they give me a lot of money and then I give that money to other people. And she goes, how much money, $1,000? I said, no, actually I write $10 million checks. She's like, $10 million? Oh my gosh, are there people, are there security there with you? And I'm like, well, no, it's actually a little bit different. I sign these contracts that are these obligations for $10 million. She goes, I don't understand this money. This is like what you call Bitcoin. I'm like, <laughs> all right, I give up. So anyhow, um, long story short, um, I, I did a talk a long time ago, actually in 2001, to the uh, Princeton Area Young Venture Capitalists Association. And out of that, um, out of that, list, out of that talk came this list, because I was like, you know, they, they asked me the question, you know, what is it that LPs do? And so this 2001 list came out. And then I did a talk at Incutel um, uh, in 2009. Uh, and I actually, interesting, through the, you know, kind of through the watershed of the financial crisis, um, you know, I, I made this addendum. Um, so let's talk about the, the 2001 list. You know, kind of what is it that we as LPs do? First off, work you know, high throughput screeners. How many of you guys read uh, Cindy in a Bar, the blog post about kind of the number of, the sheer number of funds I see? I mean, I, I have, you know, I've probably seen 2,500 different funds of all stripes. So you, you, know, you got to get pretty, pretty good at kind of figuring out what your, what your, uh, you know, what your kind of footprint is. Um, and what helps you in that regard is being a professional skeptic. Um, you've just got to be really cynical about everything. Um, it's, it's amazing how cynical uh, I've gotten. Um, and what helps me in my, my skepticism is, um, is actually wearing an investigative journalist's uh, hat or mindset. Um, basically, my job, the way I think about it, is I'm, uh, I'm looking for dirt. Like, I'm trying to turn over rocks. Because, by the way, the GPs in whom I invest and who some of you guys have seen are amazing salespeople. They can, you know, that's one of the kind of occupational qualifications. And so my job is to, is to poke holes in their story. Um, panhandler, I spend a lot of my life begging for money. Um, I basically say, please, sir, might you, might you invest in our funds so I might invest elsewhere um, and take a couple of golden crumbs. Um, and so uh, self-appointed pundit, you know, I actually take this seriously. Like, I, you know what, I, I believe that people should listen to what I have to say, not because I'm any smarter than the next guy, but because I can be 5% funnier. Um, and then it's interesting because I talked about being a counselor or a teacher. You know, we spend a lot of time working with our investment committees, and I'll talk about the investment committee process in a little bit. Um, but, but there is a real education element. Um, so here we go. You know, I'm traipsing along and working at Princeton, having a good time, deploying a couple of billion dollars. And then, boom, 2004, I get this great opportunity to go to TIFF, um, start reshaping that program. That's a big hoot. And then Shazam, 2007 hits, the first like that quant crisis in the fall, and things started getting really squirrely. And then boom, two, I, I moved out to California. I opened the office on 8808, the day the Olympics, um, you know, it's a fortuitous day, I guess. Um, and then six weeks later, uh, six weeks later, <laughs> Lehman went bust, and my budget for hiring two analysts and a marketing person and an assistant uh, went kablooey, and I had 1,450 square feet in downtown Palo Alto all to myself, mm -hmm. um, which was actually a hoot, I'll, and I'll talk about that later. That, that was actually fun. So basically then I said, you know, I got invited to Incutel, and I started doing this, you know, I put up this list to explain what we do, and then I'm like, I, you know, there's actually some other stuff we do. All of a sudden, private equity was the whipping boy. You know, if, if, you, if you guys remember, um, in 2009, basically a bunch of endowments said, holy smokes, 
we are so way out over our skis because we are just turning up and up and up the, uh, the, the spigot of, uh, of illiquid commitments um, that when the tide went out and, and our denominator in terms of our, our, uh, our endowment size went way down, we, uh, <laughs> we actually realized that, wow, we're actually like 130 or 140% exposed. Princeton, as an aside, Princeton had an 18%, 1.8% target for private equity in terms of value. And the rule of thumb in the business is that for every dollar of value in the ground, you want to have a dollar of additional commitment kind of waiting to get put to work. So kind of we tried to manage like a 35% value plus undrawn commitment target. Princeton was at like 64%. So we were so far out over our skis, it was ridiculous. And literally, if that money had all been called, you know, there were, there were a friend of mine who used to run domestic equity at a large endowment said that the university, the, the endowment was using the domestic equity portfolio as the ATM for the private portfolio. And that stinks because then you're selling stocks that are, that are low exactly at the time at which you should probably be buying to fund these capital commitments um, uh, as the capital is drawn. Um, so private equity was all of a sudden the, the bad guy. It was all our fault. Um, referee, it's amazing how many like fights we were in. I would sit in on these advisory boards and, and you'd have you know, institutions fighting with each other because these guys wanted to commit more and those guys wanted to, to shut the funds down. It was amazing how, how, how challenging that was. Therapists, I'd get these like midnight calls from my GPs saying to us, I don't know what we're gonna do. We got our investors in revolt. Have I made poor choices? And I'd say, yeah, you shouldn't have invested in those friggin' companies. <laughs> um, accountant, um, you know, literally like with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, which I also call the uh, Accountants and Auditors Full Employment Act of 2002, um, I was amazed at how much time I was spending with auditors actually like, going through. And I, I had, you know, on a look-through basis, 1,250 portfolio companies, and I'm getting grilled uh, on each and every one of those if the valuations are correct. Um, by my auditors, it was it was kind of madness. I was like, okay, company number two, hold on, let me call GP number two. Do, do, okay, company number three, I got to call GP number three, and we'd have these marathon sessions. It was ridiculous. Um, public market investor it was interesting because all of a sudden, all these private equity GPs started saying, "Oh, there's great value in the public markets. Let's do pipes. Let's take companies private." So all of a sudden, now we had to wor start wearing that hat. And then bargain hunter slash street peddler. Um, depending on your stance, you're either selling. LP interests in the secondary market or buying. Um, that actually took up a lot of people's time in 2009. Harvard famously sold a lot of their portfolio. Stanford tried to sell. There was, that was a big um, kerfuffle in the press. Um, I think in the end they were unsuccessful, um, which actually probably wasn't a bad thing. Um, so it was interesting. Now, I, I was thinking about this slide as I was pulling it together, and I thought, you know, should I add anything now? Well, sure. That's Nick Carraway. How many of you guys have seen the movie The Great Gatsby? All right, so you know Nick is this like, you know, guy who kind of hangs out and, and observes. He's a narrator, and I've always loved Nick Carraway. Um, uh, uh, you know, when I got to Yale, uh, I thought like, you know, I was just a kid from Brooklyn, and, and I kind of had this vision that I was kind of this Nick Carraway, you know, chronicling, you know, all these people and you know, saying things like, and there were men in New Haven who hated his guts. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, but there's this great line, and this actually isn't from uh, Gatsby, but it's another Fitzgerald line. Um, and this, I think, actually, I've been starting to tell people, I think this describes Silicon Valley today. The tempo of the city had changed sharply. The uncertainties of 1920 were drowned in a steady golden roar, and many of our friends had grown wealthy. But the restlessness of New York in 1927, or Palo Alto in 2014, approached hysteria. The parties were bigger, the shows were broader, the buildings were taller, the morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. Right? I mean, this, this, this is actually kind of, um, this is kind of how it feels. And as LPs, we're kind of sitting around, you know, I'm constantly asked by my investors, is there a bubble? Is there not a bubble? Like, I, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. The party's just swirling around me. It's like, you know, there's this, there's this scene, you know, that uh, Gatsby arrives in the movie, and, and, and all of a sudden, uh, Daisy says, Gatsby? What Gatsby? Right? And, and I feel like all, all the time, like, my investors are in town, are like, bubble? What bubble? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> if there's a bubble, holy smokes. There's just a great party. Um, but no, I, I'm, I'm being facetious. It's, it is interesting, though, because as LPs, we're kind of like this Nick Carraway character. We're part of the party, but not part of the party. We're watching from a distance. We're not really enjoying it the way the, way the entrepreneurs and GPs are. And we shouldn't be, because it's our job to allocate capital efficiently to the highest uh, and best risk-adjusted returns. 
it's interesting, because this quote, by the way, goes on, uh, if you guys look it up, it goes on to talk about how everybody became an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll leave that without commentary. Anyhow, all right, so let's, uh, let's talk about institutional investors, so the voodoo that we do. So as institutions um, who are the vast majority of capital deployed into venture capital, um, uh, you know, and when I say institutions, I mean everybody from endowments, foundations, pension funds, banks, you name it. Um, we ask two fundamental questions. Where to play in terms of all of, the, all of the world's assets, and how do we play once we choose an asset? And ortho, you know, I, I put this in a slightly smaller print because I actually don't necessarily believe this, but there's all the, there are all these academic studies. Like if we walk down to the finance department, you know, you'd say like, you know, tell me about the Brinson Bierbauer Hood studies. And they'd say, oh, well, they tell you that asset allocation is responsible for 96% of performance. Um, it's interesting because the Yale experience has actually, and you know, I keep calling out Yale because they were really the pioneers in, uh, in investing in, in venture capital and private equity um, in a systemic way. Um, you know, for them, the story was not asset allocation, it was execution, and that, we'll talk about that later. Um, but a great line, and this actually comes from David Swenson, the chief investment officer at Yale, he always talked about how investing is about optimizing discomfort, right? If you're comfortable, you're not taking enough risk. And that's actually a really fundamentally important, um, important insight because people are comfort seekers. Um, and then I add this, you know, some investors have wider comfort envelopes than others. And if you think about an institution with a perpetual horizon like Stanford or like Princeton, um, they can do things. They can be what do we call BLT investors. We can invest beyond the long term, right? Because we're not worried about liquidity in the short term. We're not worried about taxes. We're not worried about um, the kinds of things that, uh, that individuals worry about necessarily. There's this great story that we used to trot out at Princeton. Um, and I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but apparently in the 1450s, they built a college, uh, Pembroke College at Oxford. And the dining hall had these great timbers in the ceiling. And they went and they planted a forest because they thought in 500 years, those trees were going to be mature enough to replace the then rotted timbers in 1950. Um, and sure enough, 1950 comes around, and they cut down the forest, and they replace the timbers, and they planted a new forest. And that's endowment thinking. The challenge is that you, know, you had individuals come into the asset class. You saw a lot of this going on in 19, uh, 1999. Um, you saw it happen again in 2007. You're seeing it happen again now. And they're saying, oh, well, this venture capital stuff is fun. And they don't realize how discomforting it can be. By the way, I should pause. Yeah. Um, at Princeton, were you, um, were you there when they decided not to invest in their Excel fund that turned out to have Facebook? <laughs> How big is that salt shaker? Because I can show you my wound. Because <laughs> I made that decision twice. So it, it was kind of a foregone conclusion at Princeton, quite frankly, that we were not going to participate in that Excel fund. And so I was part of the team that made the decision to say no. And then I went over to TIFF, and we were Excel investors. And so it wasn't even like, this was like an opportunity that, oh, you know, maybe we could have if we, we were existing investors, both at Princeton and at TIFF, and I said no both times. Maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be up here. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because that, that experience, I, I've spent a lot of time in kind of investor therapy kind of on that experience. And I actually wrote a blog post kind of as a journaling effort. Um, and the blog post was called The Epistemology of Investing. Like, what is our justified true belief? Why do we believe the things we believe? Because I was sitting and I was talking um, to a person, a Sand Hill Road investor who is a household name who has had $6 billion exits, you know, kind of under his belt, maybe more. Um, he's on the board of two, you know, kind of NASDAQ 50 companies, right? And I, you know, I was kind of talking to him about this. I was like, please help me. Um, and he said, all you're saying is that you are a well-trained investor. You took the data at hand, and you made a decision which was the right decision. But good decisions sometimes have bad outcomes. So um, quick follow up. Uh, one time there was an Excel investor in one of the classes. And um, I brought this question. I said, um, how come you all were so vindictive as to not let them into your next fund? Um, yeah. And I'm curious, are VCs really vindictive if you say, no, we're not going to invest in this fund? They say, OK, guess what? We had a great fund. We're not going to let you back in. Yeah, uh, people tend to, I, I don't know if I'd use the word vindictive, but people remember who their friends were. 
right? People remember who their friends were. So you've brought up a really interesting point, which actually in an interesting way is going to come around in a couple of slides. So I don't yeah. want to, yeah. but, but it's, it's an, to, to the point of vindictiveness, it's kind of an assumption among LPs that once you say no to a fund, there's no getting back in. I will tell you a story, though. <laughs> so, um, so Yale was an investor in Sequoia. And this, I, I've never confirmed this with the Yale guys. I actually should go ask them, but this is like urban legend, right? This is like the Kaiser so say, you know, like you know, stories LPs tell each other at night to kind of give each other the lilies. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so Yale was in a bunch of Sequoia funds and then sat out for actually, if you believe what the urban legend says, they sat out a fund for a very good reason. The headline was that there was some generational, the generation like the Pierre Lamont, um, Don Valentine II, Mike Moritz, and, uh, uh, but there was some other stuff that complicated things, and they basically said, you know, we're out. And apparently Don Valentine wrote Yale a really nice note and said, you know, you've been such a stalwart partner, you were, you were with us kind of for so long, we've always appreciated the interaction. Um, if you ever want to come back into Sequoia's funds, we'll, we'll gladly have you back in. And so Sequoia went out and had you know, Fund 7, which is the Yahoo Fund, Fund 8, which was a killer fund. And the, the, the boys from New Haven, according to the story, come, uh, come back on, on bended knee and Swenson and says, please, Doug Leone. Now, do any of you guys know Doug? I mean, Doug's kind of a gruff guy. He's, he's a hoot, but you know, he's kind of like a, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's a guy, from, I don't know if he's from Brooklyn or Queens, but he's like one of my people, right? And, uh, and so Doug comes back and, and David, in the story, hands this letter across and says, well, Don says we can get back in. And apparently Doug looks at this thing, reads it over, and goes, whoosh, 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 and flips the, the paper and he goes, that was your fucking get out of jail free card. You never get one of those again. Don't disappoint us ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, at Princeton, we were like, well, la di da, we've got a $22 million allocation, and Yale has a $4 million allocation. Because <laughs> that's the fact of it. Once you, once you step away, even if you can get back in, you're not going to get back in in the size you. Another question? Yeah, so I was a little confused on uh, going back. So I don't want to take from, yeah. from your uh, lecture. No, you but... just want to sh rub more salt <laughs> in the wound. I get it. No, but what I, I, I guess I don't, I don't understand what data you had at the time, right? Because you're, you're potentially investing in their fund, but you didn't know that. Did, did you know that they had Facebook in their fund, or? No, 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 you so right? we were, no. you're investing in a blind pool. Right. Right, so what we're, what, and past performance doesn't guarantee, future, I mean, the, the big myth of it, you know, myth, truth, myth, truth, I don't know. Um, I've spent a career trying to figure out if performance is predictive. I actually don't think it is. Right. I actually think performance is not persistent. Which actually makes my job really crazy hard or crazy easy, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> so, so uh, I, guess I, just, yeah. I just have to stay one step ahead of the sheriff. So I will tell you. I'll tell you. Speaking quite frankly, um, there were a lot of people who had been banging on Excel's door because they wanted brand name exposure. And at some point in 2004, Excel realized that Harvard was stepping away, Princeton was stepping away, all these guys were stepping away. So they said, "Hey, psst, Brown University," and I use those guys. As a, they're, they're, as a metaphor. This is not actually them. Or maybe it was, or maybe it wasn't. Um, Brown University, would you like to look at our fund? And, uh, and Brown University says, sure, send us some information. And, and they send a binder with performance information. And there was this kind of collective like sigh. Oh, shit. We've spent the last five years trying to get into the fund. And then you look at this fund, and it's crappy performance, why would we give, why does anybody even give these guys money? And they want a 30% carry, are you kidding me? And it was actually, turns out that that moment was like the nadir of Axel's performance. You know, 2004 was a good year, they actually exited a bunch of stuff that looked like it had been left for dead, 2005 was a good year. You know, they had a good couple of years where if you then had, you know, kind of, if you could have turned over those cards, you might have said, okay, maybe this isn't as bad. But in 2004, you looked at their performance and you were like, this thing's uninvestable. I can't make a case for this yeah. based on past performance. Right, so I, I actually don't think it's that bad for you because it's not like you knew that Facebook was in a portfolio. You, you, there's no way you could have told, figured yeah. it out, right? And so, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, that's <laughs> fair. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, any more questions? Okay, well, keep piping up. I, I, I love the piping up. All right, so uh, all right, so for those of you who are finance heads, um, you know this is kind of how institutional investors think about um, 
you know, think about uh, where to invest. And part of the, you know, part of the secret sauce, the maybe the only free lunch in investing is that diversification actually has a risk-adjusted return benefit. So, you actually, if you have these two assets and they plot, you know, kind of this is your expected return, this is your risk. Um, if you have a 50-50 mix of these securities, you actually, if they're not perfectly correlated, you actually have this. Uh, return profile and this each of these points is a mix of these two securities rather than this line. So you actually, you know, you, you always want to be in Seattle, you know, highest expected return at lowest risk. So you actually bow your, uh, bow your, you don't want to be in Miami um, <laughs> unless you're. Um, so, you know, but of course, without getting too far into it, um, you know, Harry Markowitz won a Nobel and others won Nobel prizes for this. Modern, this is the basis of modern portfolio theory. Bill Sharp here at Stanford and others have built on this. Um, the question among practitioners is, you know, is this really a free lunch or is this just garbage in, garbage out? Because you can put anything into an optimizer and 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 basically say, oh wow, I can have, uh, I can have incredible returns at no risk, um, but it's it's all a function of your. Um, of your assumptions as anything else. So then what really happens is in practice, you actually get this like bizarre, like, you know, kind of finger in the air, man behind the curtain, let's pull all the dials um, approach to asset allocation. And so really you get kind of this optimization, but you've got, you know, heterogeneous expectations, principal agent issues, portfolio constraints, which are real, and career risk dynamics, which actually um, actually really impact your asset allocation as an LP. And then, of course, the Brits have this all figured out. Lord Keynes said, worldly wisdom teaches us that it's better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. And Jeremy Grantham says that 90% of the decisions in the asset management business take first into account the career risk associated with those, those decisions. Um, so that's something important to think about. Um, so why did venture capital have this explosion in the late 90s? Well, it's because of Yale. If you look at the venture capital fundraising markets, um, you know basically venture capital is this cottage industry raising anywhere from three to six billion dollars forever and ever and ever, and then basically people figured out that Yale was making a ton of money in venture capital. There's a famous Harvard Business School case in '95 that turned into this book, which is published in 2000. And I always say, you know, people would ask me, what's the average, uh, what's the average asset allocation, what's the average allocation to private equity? of a large institution. And I say, oh, it's 20%. And they say, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, that's because that's what Dave said it should be. And it, he actually didn't say it should be, um, but people basically read the book and they said, oh, Yale's at 20%, we should be at 20%. And almost overnight, everybody went to 20% allocated to private equity. And Dave uh, sang the glories of, of venture capital. Um, and uh, and that, that and performance attracted, um, attracted, uh, attracted scads of money. Um, in the late 90s and into the early O's. It's funny though, I teach the Yale case every now and again uh, over at Haas, and I, I ask you know, students like yourselves, I say, what's the lesson of this case? And you know, people raise their hand, give all the right, the answers that are kind of exactly right but precisely wrong. They say, oh, you, know, you wanna be illiquid. Oh, you wanna you know, exploit your, your strategic advantages. Oh, you wanna um, you know, be long dated. You wanna be equity oriented. They say all these really, really smart things that are exactly right. And I said, no, the lesson of this case is actually don't try this at home. Right? Yale has certain advantages that, that you don't have um, if you're a pension fund right? or if you're a small college in, in, uh, in Nebraska. Um, so anyhow, anybody, basically everybody started saying, you know, you, we just talked about career risk. Well, all of a sudden it became cool to do private equity and specifically venture capital. Actually, if you even look at it, this is today, uh, basically June 2013, you know, Yale has 32% of its portfolio in private equity, 31%, um, uh, yeah, 32% actual. Um, that's a freakish amount of private equity. I mean, that includes buyouts, but it also includes venture capital, on which they're very bullish. Do you, um, do you know where uh, hedge funds fit into that mm. on the asset allocation? Oh, that's absolute return, yeah. So that's under absolute return? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at actually what's startling is domestic equity. You know, if you think about the classic institution, um, you know, for a long time, a lot of institutions were like a 60-40 mix, equities, <laughs> bonds, or 65-35, 70-30, depending. Yale had, now there's a lot of equity-like stuff, like private equity is basically equity, you know, with, a, with super beta. Um, but, you know, classic domestic equity, 5.9%. Fixed income, bonds, like the insurance in your portfolio, 4.9%. I mean, that is crazy town. 
I mean, I, I, I think, but it, this, is, this is a reflection of Yale's particular competitive advantage and strategic um, positioning. No, no, that 6% of the portfolio is in equity. Oh, I see, I see. So that's the breakdown of the portfolio. This, these, are the, these are the weights to these different asset classes. Okay, it's not the returns. It's not the returns. Oh, no, 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 okay. no, 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 not at all. No. Yeah, well, yeah, well, private, well interestingly, their, their kind of 30-year IRR in private equity is like 38%. Wow. And, you know, it, it's, it, those guys are good. I, I actually like every time I get a call from from the development office, and by the way, you know I got a call once from the major gifts office, and they actually came and came to lunch, and they're like, "Where do you where would you like to go? Evia, the Rose? What? I go, oh, no, I'd like to go to the Creamery." <laughs> so we go to the Creamery and we're having grilled cheese, and they're like, you know, giving the pitch and like going to endow scholarship or this. I I, I don't have money for that. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and, you know, and I told I was upfront. I didn't I didn't pill for a lunch. I was totally up front from the beginning. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we, we, we think you're a great long-term prospect because you live in a very nice zip code. I was like, wow. <laughs> Yay, Palo Alto. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but what I did say is I said, I said, why do you want me to give like 100 bucks when like the investments office earned that in the last 18 seconds or 18 milliseconds, right? Like, really? Anyhow. So here's where venture capital, so, so basically Swenson made it okay to invest in venture capital. So, and actually this is kind of our, um, our optimizer output from Princeton. You know, here you've got all the assets plotted according to their expected return and their risk, and then you've got the correlations underlying this. And there's VC, which is like crazy, you know, high, pretty high expected return, and whoa, look at that risk. There's a really interesting question about how you measure risk and all that stuff. But you know, I always used to joke, like I actually did this as a joke and it got in a board book one year. I put lottery tickets right here. And, uh, and that wasn't perceived as very funny. Um, so anyhow, um, <laughs> so basically with venture capital, you're buying the furthest out of the money, longest dated option you can buy in a portfolio. And so that actually has some interesting outputs because I always used to say, like, who's the patron saint of venture capital? You know, some people say it's Arthur Rock. Some people say it's you know, Don Valentine. Other people say it's, it's uh, General Dorio from ARD, which became uh, uh, Greylock. Um, uh, no, it's actually these guys. It's Curtis and Lou. These guys were the New York lottery first $5 million winners, right? And they basically, you know, they basically would go around, they were on TV, you know, they won $5 million in the late 70s, and they started like getting, you know, they were, they were in all these ads, and they were the guys who'd beat the system, right? And that's basically who all LPs, you know, want to be. And it's interesting, because I always say we use these, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these lottery slogans with Ivy League veneer. So you can see, you know, Curtis is talking about optionality, but he's really saying you got to be in it to win it. And Lou's talking about asymmetric payoff, but that's just another way of saying, hey, you never know. Um, but why do we do this? Well, this is, um, this is why, and this is again from the Yale report, um, a well-executed venture program um, can add considerable value to a diversified portfolio. And this is actually an interesting, um, this is interesting, this is an execution. This is kind of my complaint against the Brinson Bierbauer asset allocation study, but I, I, don't, I won't get too far into that. Um, but basically, <coughs> This is, each of these bars represents a different asset class. So the purple is venture capital. And this is the spread between top quartile and bottom quartile. So if you were a top quartile performer, you did 35% better IRR return um, than a bottom quartile performer. And you can see these are the illiquid asset classes. And, and you're just like, wow. You know, USLBOs, natural resources, and real estate. You're just like, wow. These are all big spreads, but venture capital is crazy. This is 93 to 02. This is 03 to 12. I don't know why they did this. I got to ask those guys why they split this out. Um, because this actually, there's no bubble during this time period. And I actually believe that venture capital needs bubbles. It's actually like, it, it's endemically important. It's, it's the asset class that's most sensitive to, uh, to black swan optionality, which happens with regularity in the American economy. So any, like with any other chart, it's, it's, all, it's all endpoint sensitive, but Tim? Um, do you think Tim Swenson and Yale and the whole 90s discovery of Yale's portfolio contributed to the whole bubble? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think it's their fault. <laughs> I, I've said to them in the past, I've said Tim Sullivan, who runs private equity there, he's, he's, he's an old friend. He's like the saltiest guy you've ever met. And I, we were having, 
we were having dinner once. I said, this is all your fault. Like everything that happened is you, you guys did this. And he goes, I told Dave not to write the damn book. I told him to stop. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, I, I don't want to blame it entirely on, on But basically, you know, it's, Tom Friedman wrote this book a long time ago, or it was maybe an article, and he talks about the electronic herd. And he says, you know, you know basically, um, and it was in the context of emerging markets. And he's like, the reason we have these like booms and busts is because capital has gotten so mobile that it kind of flies around. And basically, that's what happened. You had an electronic herd stampede into venture capital in the late 90s. And Yale actually provided the intellectual framework for it. I will, get, I will put that on them. Um, but you know, people kind of were looking. You know, it was a function of all the liquidity that was in the market at that time. Um, this is just a year by year, and again, I mean, look at these bubble years. You've got eighty percent differences between the top and bottom quartile. Um, this is an interesting chart, though, because sometimes you can actually do well, and the definition of victory is being top quartile. Um, this is actually an interesting thing. This is the difference because of the skewness of venture capital, and this is like I, I'm going to be a little bit of a math geek here. Oh, this isn't very sophisticated, but sometimes you go through this and people's eyes glaze. Um, so the pooled mean and the arithmetic mean. So the pooled mean is basically if you took all the dollars, kind of stripped away the fund layer and took all the dollars that went into venture capital, if a $100 million went into venture capital and four million, 400 million came out, the pooled mean return was a 4x. The arithmetic mean is you take the number of funds and you use that as a divisor. So this fund did a 4x, that fund did a 1x, the average fund was a 2.5x. Um, so what's interesting about this actually is it basically shows you when the, when the bar is high, the, the, uh, the, the pooled mean is so much higher than the arithmetic mean and there are people who, are, who invested in uh, good funds, like, i.e. like in terms of the pecking order of funds, who invested in a good fund but they still like lagged um, I'm even confusing myself. But they basically, uh, they could have invested in the second or third best fund, and their performance is still worse than average, put it that way. So that's actually a really interesting, you know, interesting dynamic. You can actually be right and still not have made, made the kind of money you were supposed to have made, because the returns are so concentrated in the hands of so few funds. So that leads to this dynamic where people say, like, where's the beef? Right? Wow, we actually have a top quartile portfolio, and we still lag the public markets. That's a really interesting and, and difficult dynamic. So a friend of mine once said, skewness can drive sadness. And that brings a tear to the eye. Um, and then, and then uh, but people keep doing it because, uh, because startups uniquely offer the elusive portfolio octane. These are actually my neighbors. Um, this is next door to me downtown. Um, and I, was, I went out there one day, and my, my son was playing beer pong with them, although he wasn't drinking. And I'm like, why are you guys playing beer pong? And they said, oh, we just push seven, this is real estate crowdfunding startup. Um, we just pushed $750 million of transactions across our platform. It's like a nine month old company. And they've already got seven, I mean, you know, they, they've still, they're, they, they're obviously getting a very small slice on that, but like, the, it's amazing, that kind of growth. And that's why we do this. Um, all right, let me, uh, you've, you guys have seen all this lean startup stuff. Costs required to get a business to first revenue. Uh, there's a new normal. The market is actually really bifurcating into a very um, small handful of mega funds and this chaos market of, uh, of angels and super angels. So you guys saw Anne from Floodgate. They're one of the, the, the kind of flagship super angel funds. Um, did you say you had somebody from Andreessen Horowitz? Really? You know, so, so you guys have seen the, the barbell in, in action. It's really interesting because the middle is getting hollowed out of the venture capital market. And that's actually got some interesting implications. Um, and it's interesting too, by the way, and this, this section is from a, a presentation I just did to the CFA Institute, kind of uh, dispatches from disruption, the, the disruption, the new landscape of venture capital. You know, one thing I've talked about is that if you look at it, there's a lot of, cup, this bar is the capital going into startups actually into startups, and this is the amount being raised by, uh, by venture firms. So you're seeing an incredible amount of dollars going into startups um, uh, <coughs> that is coming from non-traditional sources. And that actually has some interesting implications. Who are some of these guys? You got the public market guys, you got the hedge funds, you got the kind of quasi-strategics. Um, <laughs> however, it's not without tension. 
Um, Mark got really exercised. Um, he's telling a story here in tweet form. This is, this is, these are like the epic poems. This is like you know, the odyssey of the modern age, like singing me muse. Um, uh, people in Silicon Valley generally consider this unethical and abusive. Investors from outside SV, though, may consider this standard operating procedure. So there are some tensions with folks coming into the market. Um, and you know, we're seeing these incredible mega rounds. As LPs, though, we're kind of like, huh, this is actually kind of interesting. So this actually is, is kind of the, the thing that I'm kind of my postulate, um, which is right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now, something really interesting is going on. Whether it's a, you know, the, whenever somebody asks me, are we in a bubble, I say, you know what? We've seen a fundamental market structure change. And this is actually something for you guys to think about. Um, today's late stage private companies have basically taken the place of small, the small cap market, um, the small cap public market. And so if we walked over and talked to Bill Sharp, um, you know, he would say, well, the efficient portfolio is the world wealth portfolio that captures all of the assets in the world in their proportions, and that includes intangible assets. And so if you're a public market investor, and that's part of the reason why Yale's allocation to equities is only 6.8%, because the public market is a lot less representative today of the corpus of economic activity. A lot of that has shifted to the private markets. And it's interesting because my friend Josh Koppelman did this, uh, did this chart, and he said, he did this in 2012. He basically said, you look at Microsoft, they raised $640 million in their IPO, but their peak market cap was $387 billion. Um, Apple raised $1.7 billion in their IPO, and their market cap high was $565 billion. Uh, Cisco raised $220 million, and they got to $420. So, and again, some, you know, Cisco went public a long time ago, but Josh made this interesting point. He said, all these companies together, Google, Amazon, eBay, Salesforce, the, the kind of oligarchy, you know, olig you know oligarchy of... <laughs> Um, the elite of, of the tech world, they cumulatively, cumulatively raised $32 billion in their IPOs and went on to create $1.3 trillion in public market value. That's actually amazing because that means that 97% of the dollars created by these companies went to public market investors. If you look at a company like Uber, they're raising at $17 billion around currently. If that company becomes a very big company, say it's a $100 billion company, that's still only a 5x for the public market investors. But Josh and First Round, when they got into it, I think they, I don't know what the number was, but it was like $10 million post in the first round. Like all of the value in that company has been captured by the private market investors. This is actually something that, that is really interesting to think about that not a lot of, a lot of people spend time thinking about. Yep? Switch to the private market, do you think it's because of like Sarbanes-Oxley or is it just like, is it only because of that or what are other factors driving that? So there are, there are a lot of things driving it. There's, there's actually a great, um, a great paper written by the accounting firm Grant Thornton called, um, I forget what it's called, but the, they introduced the term, <laughs> bless you, they introduced the term the great delisting machine and they talk about why the public markets are, uh, are, are on a net basis uh, losing listings. Um, and it's everything from Sarbanes-Oxley to decimalization, which took all of the profit out of trading. So banks, uh, small caps were less profitable because you can trade these companies profitably so you, you, you wouldn't dedicate research time to them. Um, things like uh, liability uh, or uh, shareholder suits are, are another thing. So, so I won't even begin to, 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 I mean, those are some of the headlines, but, but the guys at Grant Thornton do a great job of describing some of these things. And if you look at it, I think they, they threw out a number, like there's 70% fewer listings or something on a GDP adjusted basis uh, on the public markets today than there were 25 years ago. I think another aspect of that though is back in the 90s, when you uh, got to 500 investors, you had to go public basically. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, not only do you not have to do that now, but there's now a private market where I can go, go let my employees go sell their stock. Yep. And those two things take off the, a lot of the pressure. That, I, that's, that's exactly right. And, and if, so if you're a CEO and you don't want that level of scrutiny, that public market scrutiny, there's less incentive to go. It, it, c removing those constraints gives you less incentive to, 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 uh, to go public. And, and, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so anyhow, uh, 
this this is just another slide, kind of like my Gatsby slide. I, I love these things. I don't know if you guys have seen these in San Francisco. You move to San Francisco with a crowdfunded website, a dad-funded hatchback, and a no-funded bank account. You're on. <laughs> um, and there is this kind of exuberance, and I think part of it is because because we've had this this sea change. Um, I'm almost out of time, but. This is actually the fundamental question, though. This is what's called Buffett's equation. I call it Buffett's equation because that just makes it sound smart. Um, <laughs> I don't remember who actually said it. It does sound like something Warren would say. Um, but it's basically opportunity equals intrinsic value minus perception. And what Silicon Valley is really, really good at is blowing this term up immensely. We've got a great echo chamber here, and we get companies um, you know, kind of with these amazing perceptions, and it's like they're gonna gonna go out and slay the world. But the problem is that if the value is is small, then opportunity is really small, right? And so, so that you know, you can you can just see, uh, you know, the, the, you can see the you can almost envision the graph of this. Um, and so, uh, I always say, investors who fail to he heed sound financial co constructs, um, you know, are 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 in a perilous position. Um, and that's, this is a, a, you know, I've been meaning to write this blog post forever called A Value Investor Lost in the Valley. Um, but every time I, I try to write it, I end up at one of these Gatsby-esque parties. Um, uh, I'll just spend two minutes talking about tectonic shifts. Um, I call this platforms, incubators, and crowdfunding, oh my. Um, there's, you know, you guys, uh, you know, the, the, Andreessen, Mark Andreessen said, software eats the world. I actually think platform eat, eats the world. You know, here's your classic VC firm model. You have partners who, who have portfolio companies. But in the, you know, in the platform fund model, you have a firm. And you actually start to have these peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. This sign is at, at first round capital. And I actually, I actually, like every time I see the sign, I get goose pimples. Um, because Josh Koppelman and I were sitting in the West Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania Marriott um, in the Philly suburbs where we used to have breakfast once a month. And I was like really like enthralled. I had, you know, the word karetsu was like this play thing I was throwing around. Um, and I said to Josh, you know, because he was talking about how you can kind of create net, uh, the, the, he said venture firms are service businesses that invest in network businesses. What if you could actually make a venture firm look like a network, a network effect business? Um, and I said, oh, it sounds like you're talking about karetsu. He's like, karetsu sounds too businessy. He's like, what we're really talking about is a community. How can you build a community? Where where companies, you know, are incentivized to work with each other, it removes the firm from being the kind of hub in these spokes, and he says it creates incredible leverage. And he says, so we're talking about. He said we want to build a community, not a portfolio. And I said, oh my gosh, Josh, if you didn't exist, I'd have to invent you. And he goes, oh Dufos, if you didn't exist, I'd have to invent you. And I could have died right there, and it would have been great, and I wouldn't have had to think about Excel and Facebook and. <laughs> Um, so first round is one of the exemplars of this. These are all the CEOs, and they basically, you know, they, they've got all this awesome stuff going on. True does some of this stuff. There are others. Um, these are just two that are in my portfolio, so I like trotting them out. Um, uh, here's Andreessen. They describe themselves as a talent agency. You know, they've obviously got some resources that you guys know more about. Um, then you get accelerators and incubators. Obviously, Ycom. You guys, you guys know about those guys. This is actually this is a lot more fun. I can shorthand all this. Like, up in Seattle at the CFA Institute, I had to explain who these guys were and everything. Um, you know, there's PG in his in his Birkenstocks, um, and you know, obviously everybody wants to be Y Combinator. But then you get these dynamics. We're like, holy smokes! Look at LA. Look at all these friggin' incubators and accelerators. Um, and there was just a statistic. Um, I saw it in the wire this morning. Only 18% of incubators have. Uh, have their own um, self-sustaining funding sources. So basically, everybody is like on a wing and a prayer right now. I think we've got a bubble in incubators, um, but the ones that are doing it well are doing it well. Um, and then, uh, have you, I'm sure you guys have talked about crowdfunding and AngelList and all, all that stuff. Um, you know, Naval is, I, you know, I, I've known Naval for a long time, um, and I'm a huge fan. Naval basically, <laughs> Naval, Basically lobbied for Section 201C, and it basically introduces the concept of a platform that uh, that uh, that becomes a clearinghouse that doesn't have to register, which is awesome. Um, there's the guys at AngelList, um, and now we've got AngelList syndicates, which is actually really interesting. Do you guys know about syndicates? Yes, no. So basically, with syndicates. Uh, it's just AngelList. Um, Awesome stuff going on uh, with syndicates. Basically, like all of these guys. So basically, 
Kevin Rose, Tim Ferriss, Gil, Gil Pinchina. Gil, Gil, I love Gil. I thought about raising a fund several times and decided not to. Having a fund requires spending a lot of time with lawyers and accountants. And by the way, there, there are a couple of F-bombs dropped in with, with lawyers and accountants. Process people make me crazy since entrepreneurship is about challenging the established order of things. So basically with syndicates, Gil can basically say, hey, I'm going to invest in company X, and then you can back Gil and actually um, uh, uh, invest alongside. And Gil's, if he normally was going to um, write a 25K check, and all of a sudden he's got uh, you know, a million and a half dollars of potential backers, you can say, well, in company X, I want to write a 500K check, 25K, that's mine, 475 will come from these guys, and now I'm, making, I'm writing a check as big as a, uh, as big as a classic VC, and, uh, and it's being really disruptive. It's really interesting because, t you guys know Tim Ferriss? Yeah. Yeah, so Tim's, Tim's, Tim's a Princeton guy, and Princeton, he's got a reputation. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Um, but it's interesting because I was, I was talking to a, one of these, you know, kind of small, you know, uh, venture firms, uh, you know, super angel firms. And I was, you know, these guys are, you know, it's three people who are trying really, you know, they're ex-entrepreneurs are trying really hard to, uh, to, you know, make something happen. Um, and they've been raised, they've been deploying $5 million of their own money and now they want to raise a $25 million fund. So wearing my hat, when I'm talking to those guys, I'm like, all right, so at $5 million, you're writing this size check. At $25 million, you're writing this size check. You're going to, you know, it's a different strategy. You're going to be having, you know, you're going to have to have sharper elbows. How are you going to get those kinds of allocations? Um, you know, blah, blah. So we met at, at the creamery. And uh, we were sitting there, and I said, okay, so how are you guys doing in, in terms of, you know, kind of raising the, the ceiling on your investments? And they said, well, you know, we're, we're doing great. We're doing great. I'm like, okay, well, just tell me about your last deal. So, oh, well, you know, it's funny that we were talking about those two things together because in our last deal is this company, and we wanted to put $250,000 into the, into the company, which is the right size. They were typically writing 50K checks. Now they want to go up by 5X. Um, and they go, but the problem was that Angelist didn't announce this syndicate feature, and Tim Ferriss was going to invest 25K in the company anyhow. And we thought we had a handshake with the CEO that we were going to do 250K. Tim calls up the CEO and says, hey, I've got the syndicate behind me. I'm going to put in 25K of my own money and 225 of my backers, and I want a board seat. And the CEO said, sure. And they said, all of that allocation came out of our hide. And we just got cut back to 25K from the 250K that we thought we were going to be able to invest. I said, oh, wow, you, just got, you guys just got disrupted. And what I really wanted to say was, dead man walking. Um, so you know, I think I think the I think syndicates is going to be really disruptive to the small um, to the small uh, small funds. Um, and then you've got these interesting other online platforms like Funders Club, which allows you to come in alongside uh, alongside guys like First Round and Andreessen and others, um, all uh, all crowdfunding. And this is just the end. Um, this is this is more generic. Um, uh, but, the, but this is actually the most interesting point, actually. Although entrepreneurship is flurry, flourishing, caution is warranted as lower barriers to entry have worsened the signal-to-noise ratio in startup land. And that's, that's what we're all struggling with. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, a question about uh, what do you think about LPs directly investing with venture funds? For example, at StartX, if you raise a round, Stanford directly invests in you as well. Um, so it's really interesting because uh, such investing has, what, what's that old line, um, when Harriet was good, she was very good, but when she was bad, she was very, very bad. Um, that's, you know, that was our experience actually at Princeton. Um, we had a, a, a large program that existed before I got there, and, uh, and overall it did okay, but the, the results were skewed by literally one, one and a half companies. Um, uh, they uh, had that one company not gotten public. Literally, that program would have been a disaster. And it's something that we're seeing a lot of LPs looking to do. Um, I think the, 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 you know, I know Stanford wants to do more, co more direct investments. Every fund of funds is doing direct investments as kind of value added. GPs are inundated with requests. Um, and I think it's a great strategy when the tide is rising, but when the tide goes out, um, 
you know, you, you'll have, there, there are real problems with selection bias and, uh, you know, structuring. You know, I, I, I've been asked by my investors to raise a direct fund, and I've always said, you know, how am I going to outcompete, you know, first round, you know, on, on deals? So I can be first round's partner, but then, you know, but then you've got selection bias issues and, and stuff. So that, that's an interesting and rich topic that we're, you know, it's, it's like I would say with Diet Coke, you know, we're running this amazing, I am the lab rat. Right? I'm going to die, and they're going to dissect me at some point, and they'll find this softball-sized tumor in my head from all the NutraSweet. Um, yeah, so we're running this you know, kind of real-time experiment, right? And I think that's, that's the same thing with, with co-investing. And you know, experiment 1.0 showed that it was a disaster. Experiment 2.0 might be a disaster is unfair. It was unfulfilling. When you're deciding what funds to invest in, what are the most important features that so the, the question is, uh, what are the most important features I look at in a fund? Um, most LPs start with performance. Um, but I think performance is a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. So by the way, my answer is a very non-market answer. Um, things I look for specifically is are, number one, I look at the people. Do they have some, what is their edge? Do they have some particular domain expertise? Do they have um, you know, some, uh, some viewpoint on the world or thesis that's interesting? Um, uh, how are they distinctive? In a world full of really, really smart, hungry, dynamic people, how are these people world beaters? Um, then number two is strategy. Does the strategy resonate with the people? I'm kind of agnostic on, you know, there's certain things like clean tech where you're just like, I just don't see how it's going to work. But generally speaking, like, I don't know if, if you know, cloud is going to be interesting or security is going to be interesting. I try to be agnostic about that. What I try to see is whether there's resonance between the people and the strategy. Are these the right people to pursue the strategy? And it's amazing how unself-aware some people are. Like, the best example is probably a buyout example where you get these teams out of Procter & Gamble and they're like, oh, we're going to do you know, lower middle market companies with $5 million in EBDA. And you're like, well, you're used to, you, know, you think you're going to add a lot of operational value, but you're used to having these like general staffs and you know, all these resources that you're in. You just, there's just not a resonance between what you think you can do and what you're, what you're going to face you know, on a daily basis. So people, strategy, and then third is the portfolio. The portfolio is the, the, the proof of the pudding, right? That's where the people and the strategy are in action. And so I actually spend the bulk of my time with the portfolio companies trying to understand how different investors have been value added, um, you know, how the companies are better off for having had uh, that's actually how I found first round in 2003. I went and uh, I was talking to these guys. I showed up with a couple of cases of beer south of market, and I went to this company, Video Egg. Um, and I was like, guys, you know, they, they knew I was coming. Um, and I said, guys, can you tell me about your investors? And they're like, oh, these guys are great. Um, these guys suck. Oh, and they're these guys out of Philadelphia, Josh Koppelman and, and Howard Morgan. And they have made our company far better than we ever dreamed it could be because of this and that and this. And I'm like, whoa, that's really interesting. Um, so that's where, you know, like I, like I said, you know, I go on these tours of portfolio companies. That's hugely time consuming and extremely difficult to do, so a lot of LPs just don't do it. Um, instead, they look at performance as a proxy, but like I said, performance falls out of the portfolio today. Um, having seen as many funds as I've seen, kind of firsthand, especially at Princeton, the number of funds where like the $75 million fund was a killer, the $150 million fund was the bomb, the $300 million fund was really good. The $600 million fund sucked. The billion two fund was a dog. And the 2.4 billion fund was only, you know, it's like food that's only consumable by animals. That's a fund that's only like consumable by pension funds, right? Like literally it's like, oh my God. And But yet people kind of stand more because they're like, oh look, Oak has great returns. But yeah, but that's all on the small funds, right? I don't mean to kick Oak. I haven't seen their returns lately. Um, but anyhow, <laughs> and they were in Castlight, right? So that, that's good. But, but it's hard to, you know, it's hard to make a multiple on these bigger funds. And there's this, like, you know, uh, levitation of fund size always. Like, finding a fund that stays in its same size stratum is, is like finding a unicorn. Like, first round has been incredible. $22.5 million per partner per fund. Boom. It's awesome. Oh, I, I was getting all worked up. I got to get set. All right. Uh, you were talking about. Uh, oh, thanks. You were talking that uh, venture capital needs uh, booms and busts. Can you explain that a little bit more, or, or talk a little bit about that? Um, so, as an institutional investor, you can invest 
all along the risk adjusted return spectrum. And I actually know, I actually know with certainty that I can get, I can invest in funds, in a specific type of fund, and I can get one and three quarters times my money expected return with like a quarter turn standard deviation. So one and a half to two times money standard deviation. What I don't know is, uh, is over what horizon, right? Like, and this is the, there's this group that used to be the Harvard management in-house buyout shop. And the joke was that they would get you three times your money on every investment, but sometimes it might take 26 years, right? Um, but that's the beauty, you know, like at Princeton, we always said 15% um, compounded forever is a lot of money, right? But, um, but, you know, but, but that's what I was thinking about. Like I can invest in middle market companies, moderately levered cash flowing businesses and get one, point, one, one and three quarters times my money, um, day in, day out. Um, why would you invest in some of the crazy mixed up ideas that we invest in in the zip code? Right? It's madness, and the standard deviation is so big, and the risks are, are, are so myriad, right? It's, it's like growing an orchid, right? Everything, the temperature has to be right, the soil has to be right, and there are so many um, you know, exogenous variables that can impact the growth of, and development of these companies. We always used to say on the public market side, there's a fine line between being right and being early. Um, and the beauty in venture capital is you actually don't, being, being early is actually not something you get penalized for, but the competitive intensity is so big that you can get leapfrogged really easily. Um, if you're early, you can be, you know, you end up being more capital consumptive and, and you know, if, ca if there's financing risk, there's no capital out there, you know. So these things are really fragile, you know, fragile businesses. So what you need is you need the promise of these extreme booms that'll, that'll, you know, lift, um, lift all the boats that will create just the right conditions so you'll get that amazing harvest. Um, because in its kind of natural state, the risk adjusted return is just, um, is just unsatisfying relative to other asset classes. But when you do get these explosive, um, uh, uh, these explosive kind of moments, um, that actually makes it all okay. It's like, it's like, you know, I always love, I love baseball and I love, um, I love how discontinuous the home run is. Like a grand slam is the most discontinuous thing. It can change the nature of a game and that's what, that's what booms do for venture capital. I don't know if that's a fulfilling answer, but, but we can push on it if you'd like. And by, by the way, actually, if you, from a, if you look at the numbers, if you strip out the bubble, if you strip out the big tech bubble, um, venture capital has been a has not exceeded the uh, opportunity cost of equity capital, right? Like you'd, you'd have done better investing in, in in public. So the bet you're basically making is that either there's some structural change to venture capital, or uh, uh, which there I, I don't know if there will be. There could be, but I I don't know. Um, or you're betting that there'll be another boom like there was in you know in you know most recently or you know 99 or the mid you know early 90s or you know these things happen with some regularity and it's awesome because they happen with regularity here you know it's funny like people say oh well, you know we're looking for new ecosystems like is austin going to be a great place to invest boston seattle like it's it's amazing like you know all these places get lifted by like a boom and then kind of just fade because they can never pivot but this place because it attracts such great intellectual capital seems to have kind of the wherewithal to continue pivoting. What happens? Um, what happens to angel list? As an LP, what happens to like those syndicates when the tides start to go back out? Mm. It's a and great. I think it's more dramatic than funds. I mean, because money in funds is locked up over a period of time, so that kind of helps your longevity thesis that if we have a bubble and a bust, we can exist for a while longer. But um, that can go away much quicker. So if you have an answer to that question, I, I, then, I yeah, like literally, like I, because because this is the hypothesis that we're testing right now, because it, the way I described the, the, uh, the, the dynamic that you allude to is, you know, in the public markets, if an idea is disproven, goes bad, capital is destroyed, it's gone. In the private markets, you know, because of the commitment structure and the lockups, 
you've got this kind of persistent capital, and the LPs can bitch and moan, but at the end of the day, they've got to they've got to write the checks when when the capital is called. So you get this really you know interesting dynamic, um, and the stale prices kind of fog everything. It's interesting because Gil Pencina has three and a half million dollars lined up for his syndicate, but that's just people saying, "Hey, I think this is a good idea." And if if the market goes south, you know, some of those dentists, but they're not dentists because Angels keeps the the bar high, but but some of those folks might say, oh, wait a second. I said I was good for 50K, but actually I've got to pay for college. So that how illusory. So now the question is that, you know, Angelus is struggling with how do you kind of thread the needle of having committed capital, um, but without having to kind of bring some of the bad stuff like lawyers and accountants that come with having that committed capital. Right. Um, but I, this is, and I, by the way, the answer to this question, I think, is going to have to be figured out in the next year. And the reason I was so, you know, kind of coy about my answer, you know, I'm actually trying to figure it out myself, which is why in the workshop, I'm, I want you to figure it out for me. And then what about also, because I think Naval is also trying to raise his own fund himself, right? He, a sideline that can like pick the top people and a few other large institutional investors will come in and kind of be alongside that. So that's sort of to displace in case if the tide goes out and the whole so, platform kind of goes belly up. Yes, yeah, so that's a main lane fund. Yeah. So I, I'm an investor in the main lane fund. Um, and uh, and that does have committed capital and it does, it does have uh, some interesting dynamics about how they get looks at syndicates and, in, you know, and for, so, so yes, that, the short answer is yes and I think that's a, a good idea which is why I put some money in it. But there are other reasons to do that fund too. Because, you know, there's a great book called We Make the Road by Walking. And we're, we're, we're figuring all this stuff out. Have uh, VCs ever called you um, I guess, capital pool, whatever that's called, and you saw the company and you're just like, oh my god, I just cannot. I mean, I have to do it, but I really, really don't want to do this. Um, uh, so it's interesting because in buyout land, you do get, you know, you'll get a notice to say we're calling 7% to invest in this company. In venture world, you know, they're, they're doing so many investments that you'll just get a general um, capital call. You know, we're calling 5% of capital to, you know, for whatever reason, um, for, for general investing, they call it, or for follow-on investments. Um, I have, though, uh, I have, though, a couple of times in the buyout space gotten capital calls, thought about the company, and, and like, you know, I've, and I've called the GPs and been like, really, guys? You're paying seven and a half times EBITDA for this company that's growing, it, you know. But at some level, the reason we're limited partners and they're general partners is I have, you know, I pay them because I trust them, right? I've made that decision. I don't, I don't have any say. I can't not fund that capital call because then I'm a defaulting limited partner, and I, and there's onerous penalties to that. Um, but that's the kind of thing where, like, you know, especially if it's off strategy stuff, I'll go into the advisory board. Um, in cases where I'm on the AB or, or call an AB member and you know, kind of pound on people and say, like, why, 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 why are you doing this? But then it's interesting, actually, because then you get, like, this, this like, August Capital. Um, you know, August Capital put a third, you know, they're an early stage venture firm, and they put a third of their 2000 fund into Seagate, which was then a public company. One third, which A is crazy, and B it's a public company. Like you guys are an early stage venture fund, and that like that one investment returned like four x the fund, right? I mean, it was like one of the epic investments. So you're like, so you know, we as LPs like kind of straddle this line. Like, wait, we actually, you know, at some point you have to say like, Luke, let go. You know, it's and it's a. Quick question. So I'm curious, your your client, your LP, typically, what percentage of their um, side of the fund or whatever, side of the pool, they invest with you. And do they also invest in, in this asset class besides for investing in your uh, fund of funds? So, uh, so I'll give two answers to that based on my two different uh, recent experiences. So at Princeton, obviously, it was just Princeton, right? So it was, but we, and so we, uh, at TIFF, we worked with small and mid-sized nonprofits. Um, and they would, t we raised annual funds. You get exposure to an, a single vintage. And we were finding that, that typically institutions were putting between 1% and 2% of their endowments in each annual fund. So that would probably correspond to about a 5 to 
allocation, which I think is low. Um, if it's 2%, then it's 10 to 14, which actually is probably, probably right. But um, it's interesting at VIA, we've got two different products. One is very much like the TIFF product where we're seeing you know, kind of 1% to 2% per, per year. We raise multi-year funds, so we're seeing them put in kind of 3 to 5% of their endowment in one fund. Um, but it's interesting because then my kind of passion is the seed fund of funds. Um, and we've got very, very sophisticated investors, you know, kind of multi-billion dollar endowments, and they're putting, so DuPont Trust is a $3 billion investor, or $3 billion endowment, and they put $7 million in our fund. Um, so that's a rounding error to them. But part of the reason they're doing it is because I'm finding, I'm also their man on the ground here, and I'm finding their opportunities. So we did a fund data collective. So we put $7.5 million in, and they ended up putting 20 in. And so, um, so they're using us as their bird dog. Which actually, interestingly as an aside, brings up some really interesting disintermediation questions, right? Like, are, you know, over time, I like to think of it as a partnership, but over time they can say, well, thanks, Chris. <laughs> you know, and, and one investor in our first fund actually said, you know, they're a $3 billion foundation in the Midwest, and they said, look, we're going to give you $5 million, and we, we're going to consider that tuition, and we're going to pick your brain, and then we're going to, you know, we're going to look for, for funds in this space on our own. I said, great, because I... We, we want to be good partners. I'm a nice guy. Like, I'm all collaborative. Um, I believe in kind of the open architecture, you know, stuff of the of Silicon Valley. But I also was like, what you really want is first round, and you can't have any. Ha ha. <laughs> um, any more questions? Yeah. So along, along that line, I'm just curious what you see the trends of VC. I want to push you a little bit more on that. Yeah. Like, you know, so you're talking about first round where they create this, like, network event and platform. And is sort of a similar mm -hmm. way. Do you think that's where VC needs to go is where it's headed? Or... You know, I, I keep thinking about Kleiner, which used to be such a famous VC, and in the last five years it hasn't done well at all, which is more traditional. And so is there a place for, like, that, or does it have to sort of still move towards this, like, platform? And So it's interesting because, you know, Josh's, Josh Kaufman's comment about, about network effects is he's like, network effect businesses tend to be, network effect markets tend to be winner-take-all markets. And so I actually, you know, I actually wonder... You know, is you know, do Andreessen and first round if they're different strata, you know, take it all. Now the fact of the matter is that there's far more opportunity than there are, um, you know, there is bandwidth at either of these firms. Um, but I actually think, and it's interesting because both the first round guys and the Andreessen guys, they share a lot of rhetoric, right? And they basically say, look, we are a service provider. Right? And I don't know how they, they describe themselves when they're here, but, but I, I heard the first round guys describe, the, describe it this way all the time. And the, the way A16Z has structured themselves, um, you know, they, they, they act this way. We say, look, our customer is the entrepreneur, and we're going to provide them a suite of services. And I think they've raised the game, uh, raised the tempo, and, and, and changed, uh, changed the dynamics. Um, because if I'm an entrepreneur now, I can I say, okay, either I can go to partner X, who's a great dude and fun to have beers with, and used to work at Cisco, so he knows the, you know the, this person, this person that can help me in my market. Well, that, that actually has that time decay is very rapid, right? In terms of um, in terms of you know kind of that that type of expertise and, and contact matrix. Um, but uh, or or I can say I can go to first round and I'm going to get you know. Uh, all the kind of, the, if you go on their website, and I don't mean to pick on, you know, first round, but they have the first round.com slash uh, platform. They talk about some of the, the stuff they do electronically, like internal, you know, kind of internal message boards and internal Yelp for service providers and, you know, blah, 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 where, you know, model board docs and stuff where you basically save entrepreneurs time by, by, by taking non-value added processes and, and automating them, right? That's actually far more interesting than, um, than, uh, than you know, my buddy Joe, who's gonna be on my board and show up you know, once a quarter. Um, it's interesting because I just got an email while I was coming over here from some random venture fund back east. We've just hired so-and-so as our VP of platform. This is like the new hot title, VP of platform. And so but there are only gonna be so many that can do it well. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.